There we go. Okay. Hey. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> How's everybody doing? Okay. Good. Good to see everybody. Um, you know, I, um, first of all, I'm really happy to uh, be able to spend some time with you guys. You know, um, it is um, always wonderful to be able to um, spend time in community and to uh, see some old friends, some of the names that I, that I see that are present are people that I've known for quite a while and also to see some new faces and to, um, and to see, meet new members of my family. People who have been in, who are members of my community and uh, I see Judy, Judy and Dean are here. Oh, that's so sweet. Good to see you guys. Um, and just to extend that circle of, uh, of, of brotherhood and sisterhood. So I, first of all, wanna start there. Uh, let me also begin by saying, um, um, it goes without saying, uh, for all of those who are on this call, on this Zoom meeting, who are Baha'is, you know this already, but if there's someone here who does not know this, I in no way am a representative, uh, an authoritative representative of the faith. Um, I am not a clergyman. I am not an appointed interpreter of anything in the writings. I'm a simple Baha'i, I've been a Baha'i since 1992. I have a particular walk in the faith that is unique to my own life experience. Uh, and that's the perspective that I, uh, that I share from. Uh, so I want to be clear on that. Also, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a person who uh, particularly likes, likes traditional uh, kind of lecture format. I don't know about you, but I find that to be really boring. So uh, for me, I really like to engage uh, in conversation and dialogue. I'll share some thoughts, um, some things that are on my heart. And then for me, the real learning uh, begins when we actually engage in some conversation with questions and also thoughts. So uh, I'm going to push through uh, the, the part for me, which is, which is um, the not as fun part, although it is, it's fun to share. It can be inspiring and all of that. Um, but I really love to push through that and to get to the uh, conversation and the dialogue. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking about uh, uh, what to share in this um, a conversation in this dialogue. Um, you know, first of all, we know that uh, when we come together, we have conversation that uh, that this is not uh, ultimately the work, right? I mean, this is hopefully a catalyst for doing the work. But um, just talking about the issue of race, the issue of oneness is really just an entryway or uh, the threshold to actually engaging and doing the work at building community across cultural lines, across gender lines, across uh, social economic backgrounds and so forth and so on. So um, it's good to remind myself of that as I'm engaging in these conversations. Um, uh, thinking about uh, the, the, the topic, which I know is loaded and uh, has a lot of um, um, potential uh, import and meaning kind of layered within it. And uh, it just came to me. Um, and I was thinking about this, I, I think as I was reflecting and, and thinking about what I wanted to call the talk or um, the direction that I that I kind of wanted to facilitate and take it in, I started thinking about this whole idea of uh, warrior marks, and um, of course we know that warrior marks um, has um, a lot of uh, cultural associations. Of course, in different parts of the world, it can be part of an initiation process where uh, boys and girls are marked in different communities across Africa to uh, mark a uh, transition from one. Um, you know, from one um, moment in their development to the next uh, phase in their development. Um, we also know that among uh, indigenous communities and amongst uh, Native American communities, um, they also have a process of warrior mark making on the body to, um, for different ceremonial reasons and, and, and things like that. Um, I'm tying the concept of warrior marks in, in light of this discussion to this whole idea uh, the spiritual reality of love as being the binding force of um, all uh, phenomenal reality and spiritual reality. And um, thinking about that, you know, this, this whole idea of a fierce love ethic. Um, the sociologist, uh, um, thinker, writer, um, commentator, social critic, um, 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 Bell Hooks, who just recently passed away not too long ago. Uh, Got to give big up to Bell Hooks, a great inspiration for uh, some of my thoughts on this matter. Um, she talked in some of her writing about this whole idea of a love ethic. Um, ethic, of course, uh, denoting um, 
a set of moral principles, right, that guides us. And of course, as Baha'is, we practice a set of moral principles as issued by um, Baha'u'llah, reinforced through the example of Abdul Baha, uh, and then also through the guidance of the Guardian, Universal House of Justice, things like love, forgiveness, um, mercy, courage, um, perseverance, uh, commitment, dedication, um, uh, even essence, um, all, you know, all of these wonderful humility, all these wonderful principles, moral kind of, that forms a kind of moral framework that helps to guide our lives. So um, this idea of love, the ethic of love, um, you know, also ethic has a relationship to work ethic. Um, you know, the diligence required to accomplish a goal, to persevere, to push through, uh, through challenges and difficulties um, on the path, uh, on the pathway to a goal in a professional setting or in some other setting that's important um, to us for various reasons. So this whole idea of a work, work ethic, right? So this fierce love ethic, fierce, you know, in the sense of um, relating to the whole idea of courage, um, um, a fierce love ethic in the sense of uh, a love ethic that does not compromise, um, that is not necessarily sentimental, um, but is actually a demanding love, as Dr. Martin Luther King used to call it. He said that he was for a demanding love, a love that requires of us to do something, not just to feel something, but to do something, to make a commitment through action. Um, and it's this kind of love, it seems to me, that is um, is so vitally needed in the in the um, in this moment in human development. Uh, as we look around the world, all the issues that we see that are afflicting the body politic. We just talked about the um, um, the brutal war in Ukraine that's going on. Our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, um, and my heart has been, uh, as I'm sure all of you has been uh, touched, as I watch uh, this um, this really. Um, really just uh, a debilitating, soul-crushing um, brutality going on in that country. Um, and then also, um, you know, there's, there's another dimension to that too that also um, is, is, is um, heart-rendering and, and, and difficult to hear. And of course, we know that, um, that in Ukraine, um, Ukraine is a multi-ethnic um, society. And we know that as people are leaving the country, um, our brothers and sisters who happen to be white Ukrainians, are having a much easier time getting um, across the border than their brothers and sisters who happen to be of African descent. So um, that's another level of the tragedy. Doesn't take anything away from what's going on in Ukraine. We can hold those two realities at the same time and feel a sense of sadness for both of those realities. So, um, and you know, and of course there's uh, um, everything that's been unfolding here in this country with, um, uh, with the perpetual um, state of police brutality visited upon black and brown um, on the black and brown body, uh, the policing of the black and black and brown body in public space, which has a long tradition going all the way back to antebellum slavery in the deep south and also in the north, um, where um, there was a desire to um, corral and uh, to control the movement of the black body. And this is not only just a local phenomenon to the United States, it's also global. Um, as we see it playing out in other spaces around the world. Um, and the first example I cited was what's going on in Ukraine and people trying to get across the border. Of course, uh, we have issues with the environment, uh, the total uh, instability of political systems where people have historically placed their trust, placed their hopes for the future, the implosion of those systems as they struggle to find ways to address, to adapt to the changing circumstances and requirements of the age, right? And then we also see the implosion of faith communities um, of the Christian church where people are, have been leaving in droves um, because of some of the hypocrisy, because of some of the abuse of the authority, because of the, because of the moral inconsistencies that people have seen expressed um, in the church. And we know about the struggles in Islam and, um, and uh, other faith, faith communities. Um, not to say that there's not incredible work being done in some of those communities. Of course, there is and continues to be, um, but uh, any um, unbiased assessment of where we are um, as a global human, fa human family in terms of our spiritual, where we are spiritually and our religious practice, uh, we have to um, uh, draw the conclusion that uh, people are very disillusioned with um, you know, the traditional um, faith communities and some of the things that they see going on. 
So humanity is in, um, in many ways dire straits. So we have um, all of these institutions are crumbling in the institutions, the perpetual um, existence of racism, of sexism, of um, classism, uh, which in many ways is interrelated and intermingled with racism. Um, uh, and the um, desire to, um, to uh, allocate power to one group over another. So we have all of these uh, challenging struggles going on and, um, and uh, of course happening in conjunction with that in many circles is the death of hope, is the feeling that some sense that uh, we have passed a Rubicon and um, a point beyond which we cannot, um, we cannot turn back from. And, um, and a kind of nihilism, a soul debilitating nihilism, uh, people giving up um, on life and on the belief in humanity's ability to address the challenges um, that afflict us. So that very real diagnosis of where humanity is in one sense, right, is something that we're all confronting. Um, and of course, if one were to preoccupy oneself with that reality, certainly all of us at one point or another would feel ourselves being divested of hope, this kind of sapping of our belief in the future. It seems to me in my own um, experience um, in religious study and my own personal journey um, um, through uh, spiritual reality, I became a Baha'i in 1992. Prior to that, I had a, a varied and um, diverse religious experience. I had been um, a member of the Southern Baptist Church. Um, I had been a member of the Nation of Islam. My father was deeply inspired by the teachings of Malcolm X. Um, I had uh, done a deep dive in the Tao Te Ching, uh, which I still believe is one of the most um, profoundly beautiful um, books on spirituality I've ever read. Um, I had read the Bhagavad Gita, um, reading the Old and New Testament, just doing a really diverse dive, looking for a deeper meaning um, to life than just a materiality uh, and achievement and accomplishment, material gain. Um, and coming in contact with the Baha'i Faith when I did, I, I was uh, in my 20s. Um, this was the early, um, uh, this is the mid 1990s. And I had come out of a spiritual tradition um, that had uh, given me a sense of my uh, inner reality, my connection to the divine, to God. But there were some fault lines um, in the practice uh, of some of these expressions of faith that I found deeply troubling. One of those, um, of course, was the power of the clergy. And um, I met some extraordinary um, clergy people who are, um, certainly doing their best to shepherd their flock in loving ways. But I also saw the corruption of the station of the clergy. I saw the um, injustice of the position of the clergyman, not only to the flock, but also to the clergy person, um, placing so much responsibility and so much kind of, um, um, kind of reverence of a person. And sometimes the danger for human beings is that we get lost in the personality and we forget the light that is gives that personality its dimension. We forget um, the presence of the living God that is undergirding everything. Another was the, um, the sustained practice of racism, even within religious circles. Um, the fact that um, as um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. used to say that Sunday is the most segregated day in America traditionally, that you had a black church, a white church, an Asian church, a Latino church. Um, but there seemed to be a, a, a real divide when it came to having everybody coalesce around this faith, which seemed to me, it came from his holiness, Yeshua or Christ, came through him, the messenger, the manifestation of God for his age and his time. Everything that I read in the New Testament, the uh, the incredible parables, his teachings seem to speak to all of humanity. So it didn't make any sense to me why there should be these segregated religious practices. Of course, understanding the history of racism in America, um, one can understand that the development of a black church was out of necessity, out of existential threat 
because you could not be safe in a white church or if you were physically safe, you were relegated to a colored only section. So the enslaved, the sons and daughters of the enslaved sought spaces first in hush harbors, right? Spaces in the woods, secret spaces where they could gather. They could give full omission to their emotions. They could, they could express themselves. They could sing their songs. They could dance. They can sing the spirituals. They could plan escape. They could plan rebellion, you know? The development the establishment of these communities of faith out of necessity, not out of an initial desire to have a segregated space, but because it was a requirement for spiritual, internal, moral survival, right? So I had some deeply um, problematic issues with my experience with faith communities I had come from. At the same time, I felt profoundly um, grateful uh, and continue to feel and uh, to remain profoundly grateful for those experiences, because had it not been for my investigation of the Quran, had it not been for my investigation of the Old and New Testament, had it not been for my interrogation of the Tao Te Ching, of the Bhagavad Gita, I would not feel this sense of the universal call of the spirit. It's Khalil Gibran and the prophet talks about that plucking of the string of the heart, like a lute, right? That we all have, which is about spirit. In essence, when we hear the truth, when we come in contact with the truth, it touches something deep within ourselves and reverberates in our spirit. It enlarges us, it expands, right? It makes us larger than who we were before we heard it. Baha'i Faith talks about, um, in one of the many metaphors, that the religion uses um, to explain um, the interrelationship of the different manifestations of God. It talks about religious experiences has been like matriculating through a school, right? And in some sense, the different revelations that have come to man throughout human history are like matriculating through a grading system throughout school. You know, we move through first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, move on into high school, college, so on and so forth. And how in moving from one grade to the next is not a denigration of the knowledge that you learned previously. It is actually an enhancement of the knowledge. It is a fulfillment of the knowledge, right? Because had you not learned what you needed to learn previously, you would not be prepared for that new knowledge, those new set of principles, those new teachings. In any unbiased look at the history of religious teachings throughout humanity, we can see that there is this continuum, right, of spiritual teaching that is unchanging. That is why you can find uh, the golden rule in all of the great religions, how we should aspire, how we should treat one another, right? Treating one another as I treat myself, desiring for my brother or my sister, that which I desire for myself, right? And you can find examples of this in all of the holy books. So this spiritual continuum, this interconnectedness between the different revelations being founded on this kind of spiritual vibrational field, oscillating between one another, so all the revelations in terms of their spiritual energy and spiritual teachings. What changes? The social teachings. Because society changes. And so God in his, in his or her infinite wisdom and mercy, in his or her grace, right? Diagnosis, those things that aileth the body of mankind and then like a skilled divine physician that the great being is prescribeth the remedy. So moving then embracing the Baha'i Faith in 1992, and I did, which for those of you who might be on this Zoom meeting don't know, that was the fruit of the holy year. Um, it's a common term in the Baha'i Faith, the fruit of the holy year, because it was the 100th anniversary of the passing of Baha'u'llah, the glory of God, the prophet and founder of the Baha'i Faith, right? The latest in the family of messengers of God, right? That have gone back through time, through generations, Yes, giving mankind, bringing mankind, ushering humanity into that new 
grade, that new level of development moving us towards an age of maturity. Yes? In some sense, in a very real sense, fulfilling the teachings of peace be upon him, Prophet Muhammad. Yes? Fulfilling the teachings of His Holiness Yeshua Christ, fulfilling the teachings of Moses, fulfilling the teachings you know, of the inheritance of Bhagavad Gita and the other holy text, and not only those messengers that we know about through written text, but also those that we do not know. For if it is true that the Bible says that God has never left us alone, then certainly there have been messengers to humanity around the world at different points in our history, some that we know of and some that we do not, forming a brotherhood, a sisterhood of divine knowledge revealed to mankind at different points in our development in our stages of growth, moving us, loving us, ushering us, conjoling us, pushing us, forcing us into a new level of our development, of our maturity, of our spiritual understanding, and giving us the social tools to make our phenomenal reality, right? More perfect, more reflective of the spirit of the divine. So, as a black man going to school at Morehouse College, I still live not too far from Morehouse College here in Atlanta, Georgia. I live in what we call down here in slang, the Swats, which is Southwest Atlanta, Georgia, which is where Morehouse is located, Spelman, Clark Atlanta University, forming this kind of bedrock, right? Of historically black intelligentsia, but not only that, of also black service, black spirituality, the development of the grandchildren, the sons and daughters of the enslaved, AUC Center was established to educate those souls and service being a component as the mind grows, so also does one's commitment and dedication to service. The one without the other, you know, is um, actually uh, indicative of someone who is not fully developed or moving towards a point of being fully developed. So those two things working in tandem together. So as I was going to school at Morehouse College, um, and of course, all of us matriculate through that, through that college in the shadow of Dr. Martin Luther King, but not only in the shadow of Dr. Martin Luther King, but also in the shadow of the great educator, Benjamin Mays, right? In the shadow of so many men and women, Spelman with its cadre of brilliant, intelligent, spiritually deep and service oriented black women who have been making profound commitments to humanity since its inception, growing up, you know, going to school, in the shadow of these towering figures having an influence and an impact on my life, in particular along the issue of race, which is inescapable, yes, in America. In particular, as a Black man who oftentimes felt the social pressures as I moved through public space, felt you know, this uh, perpetual surveillance as I was moving through public space, felt as I would go into stores and maybe look for a pair of jeans, that I was generally the one, if I was the only person of color in the store, particularly black man, I was the one who was always being asked, is there anything I can get for you? Do you need anything? Not once, not twice, but over and over again. Feeling that state of perpetual surveillance, looking at the history of my family with, uh, through an objective lens, or as objective as I can be, um, looking at the uh, enslavement of both sides of my family, my father's people picking cotton in Texas, my mother's people cutting sugar cane in the Caribbean, in the US Virgin Islands, which was previously called the Danish West Indies. Seeing the lineage of enslavement, the dispossession of, first of all, one's language, one's culture, one's land, um, and then all of the social, the policy decisions that were made to make of people of African descent here in the West, as the great um, sociologist um, and lawyer Derek Bell says, the faces at the bottom of the well. Yes, the faces at the bottom of the well. In 1976, when um, I was a small child, and I remember very clearly when the Roots miniseries first aired, Alex Haley's um, seminal work about the history of his family, tracing it all the way back to West Africa. And I remember what a jolt that was to my consciousness as a boy, my parents sitting my brother and I down, my older brother, making sure that we watched this story. I think it was six or seven part story. 
And I remember what a profound impact it had on me even then, because it was so rare to see such a diverse representation on television. Television at that point, in a very real sense, was truly whitewashed. So I had grown up steeped in this kind of um, cauldron of consciousness, right? Cultural consciousness, cultural awareness, right? And so the issue of racism was something that from a very young age, I was taught was very important. And then growing up and hearing the speeches of Dr. Martin Luther King and hearing the sonorous quality to his voice, hearing the way that he sang his ways through his speeches more than he actually spoke his speeches, the timbre, the rise and the fall, right? The way he would use the highs and the lows in pitch, the ways his language would be expansive, you know? We're all caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied together forever in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. For some strange reason, I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be. No man is an island unto himself, each man a piece of the continent, a part of the whole. And then he goes on towards the end to say, any man's death diminishes me for I'm involved in mankind. Therefore never seek to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee, this rise and fall, this timbre in his language and being intoxicated by the sound of his intonation, his tones, and then the brilliance, the brilliance of his reasoning and the way he was so able to diagnose uh, the wounds, the sicknesses that afflict society. So growing up in that kind of, being steeped in that kind of tradition, when I heard about the Baha'i Faith in 1992, um, I had one of the things that was very important to me was to see expressions of brotherhood in practice as a conscious, intentional approach to the way one chooses to live one's life. Not a theory, not an intellectual exercise, um, not a conversation, but seeing people who were willing to go into the cauldrons of test and difficulty to build community, to extend this notion of family, right? To live the reality of our interdependence and our oneness. So when I read the Baha'i writings in 1992, I, I um, was seeing a, a brilliant, beautiful young woman at um, Spelman College at the time, a talented actress. I, believe it or not, at the time, thought I would be an Episcopalian priest. I was apprenticed to a priest on campus. I was quite serious about my commitment to the priesthood. The young woman who I was seeing, who was not a Baha'i incidentally, and this, this is a profound dimension and part of this story. She was good friends with a Baha'i on the campus at Spelman College, a woman who was one of the pillars of the Atlanta Baha'i community. And she said, you know, I've been spending time with this young man who's at Morehouse, and he says that he wants to be a priest, but he's not a priest, but I think he might like the Baha'i faith. So I wind up meeting this woman through my girlfriend at the time. We look at each other and immediately, I'm sure that all of you have had this experience, there was a clear recognition at a soul level. There was something deeper operating and we looked at each other and said, do I know you? My birthday was coming up and um, God is anything if not funny. Um, and this woman who now has been a long time kind of godmother to me said that, you know, I could go to the store and buy you something but I wanna give you the most precious thing that I have. And I said, what is that? And she gave me a book of Baha'i prayers. Now, mind you, at that time, I'd never heard of the Baha'i faith, never heard, heard of Baha'u'llah. And of course, in my deep humility, I assumed that if I had not heard of it, it must not exist. <laughs> or if it did exist, it was not worth knowing about. <laughs> I didn't even know how to say Baha'u'llah's name. It took me a long time to wrap my tongue around that. It was foreign to me. It was strange. It felt strange on the lips. It felt strange. It moved across the tongue. So... I made the faithful decision to crack open the prayer book. And I noticed something profound happening as I was reading through the prayers. 
I recognized a very familiar feeling that was rising in my heart. It was the same feeling that I felt then and feel now when I read the parables of His Holiness Christ. It was the same feeling that I felt then that I do now when I read the teachings in the Quran, the story about the life of Muhammad. It was the same feeling that I felt then that I do now when I read about Moses' journey, taking the Israelites out of the land of toil and bondage into a land of milk and honey. It was the same feeling that I felt when I read some of the beautiful teachings of the indigenous leaders, Red Cloud, Sitting Bull, the great wisdom enshrined within their teachings. It was a feeling that I recognized that I knew spoke to something deeper at the heart level, something that was beyond intellect, something that was in a strange way was not about reason, but encompassed all reason. It was beyond reason in a way. Something that was reverberating and vibrating in such a way that I knew it had to be reckoned with. And so that led me into an investigation of the Baha'i faith. And as I, investigated the faith and began to fall in love with the teachings of Abdul Baha and met some Baha'is and, you know, and, and met some amazing people in the Baha'i community. And let me be clear, um, first of all, um, before I go any further, I do not ever want to paint the impression that the Baha'i community is perfect because it is not. The Baha'i community is made up of a diverse group of individuals, all from particular backgrounds, all with their baggage, all with their gifts, the things that they're struggling with, the things that they're wrestling with. It is community trying to come together under the principle that is the sine non of all principles in the faith, which is the oneness of mankind, struggling, wrestling with, failing, achieving, taking steps forward, maybe taking a step back, but committing to do the work, that, that is what the Baha'i community is. So I always wanna say that and share that in love with people who may be on, on any conversation um, where I might be facilitating or, or serving in some other capacity um, because your gaze needs to be fixed first on the revelation on the teachings of Baha'u'llah. And discovering for yourself, first of all, if you feel that reverberating energy deep within your breastbone, deep beneath the muscle, the muscle area of your body, the skeletal structure of your body, deep within the soul and your well-being, in, 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 in the roots of who you are, right? Something vibrating beneath the surface that you have to reckon with. Which leads me to another principle of Baha'i faith, which is so important, independent investigation of the truth. Another challenge that I had when I was in, in engaged in my very religious experiences was that humanity's reason, one's ability to think through um, difficult, um, challenging circumstances, one of one's ability to question was not something that was generally held up in high esteem in particular religious circles. And we talked about the social teachings being different than the spiritual teachings. So Baha'u'llah, again, the messenger, the prophet of God, the manifestation of God, as we Baha'is call him, in his infinite wisdom, making a corrective to that in the, through the social teachings. So in this revelation, Baha'u'llah essentially says, independent investigation of truth is a spiritual law. That means it's not my place to meddle. It's not my place to, um, to tell you what to believe or not to believe. It's not my place to interfere with your ability to question and wrestle with spiritual reality. On the contrary, my role is to encourage you to be present with you, to offer examples of my own experience, and then to let you make a decision. 
And whatever that decision is in no way inhibits us from being family. We are one human family. Doesn't matter what background you come from, what part of the world you come from, whether you are materially rich, materially poor, whether you're middle class, whether you're educated or uneducated, whether you're PhD or no D, it doesn't matter. One human family, right? Going to Morehouse, one of the things that they would um, teach us um, as black boys matriculating into manhood, right? Was to be proud of our cultural heritage, right? To act as a wedge between ourselves and racism, a sense of pride, right? In the accomplishment of our forefathers and foremothers. The great actor, Sidney Poitier, uh, who just recently died, who I have tremendous respect for, um, said that when he left the small island of Cat Island, he was born on Cat Island, which is a small island in the Caribbean, um, which incidentally was, the vast majority was black. He didn't grow up with any notion because he was immersed in, in, in this pool of blackness. And, and the whites that did exist on the island didn't evidence any superiority in terms of how he was socialized. So he didn't grow up with this notion of hierarchy, racial hierarchy. So when he came to Florida and experienced racism for the first time, he said what he had to do to inhibit its corrosive effects on his psychological and spiritual well-being was to develop a sense, an inflated sense of self that could be a wedge between him and the sickness evils of racism. So when somebody would diminish him or they would try to constrain what he was able to accomplish, he would say, oh yeah, that's who you think I am? Watch me, watch me run this race, watch me win. And didn't he win? So at Morehouse learning this sense of, of racial pride, of, of, of of, of belief in the contributions of people of African descent. And not just in the realm of entertainment, not just in the realm of um, singing and dancing or on the basketball or football field, but also in the, in the realm of the arts, in the realm of the sciences, in the realm of philosophy, in the realm of spirituality. So it was very important for me to be engaged in my life beyond my education to help address and redress the issue, the enduring issue of racism. Now, Baha'i Faith says that uh, humanity is one. It's a nice sounding slogan, it sounds beautiful. Would look really good on a bumper sticker. Indeed, we, in the past, Baha'is have had some bumper stickers that have said humanity is one. Looks really good. Sounds good when you say it. Right? But what does that look like in practice? If it's true that we're one human family and scientists now have caught up, they've let go of the, um, you know, the, the um, sicknesses of epigenetics and these sort of things that uh, where they would class, um, they would say that um, there were several different distinct races in the human family. This one race, that's the human race. There are variations off that theme, like a jazz composition. I don't know how many of y'all like jazz. I love jazz. John Coltrane's Love Supreme. Doom, doom, mm -mm. I love Supreme. You have all of these players. They're held together by this, this structure of the music, but then they branch off and they play. That's like the family of humanity. Cultural expression is a branch off of this core theme of our shared humanity, right? Being a proud um, African-American man, as a Baha'i, I had to reckon with and come to terms with the fact that that was not my primary identity. That as much as I read my books on E. Franklin, e. Franklin Frazier, read my books on Dr. Martin Luther King, on Malcolm X, as much as, much as I was looking at the philosophical studies of Cornel West, um, and other great thinkers, um, other great men and women who've made contributions, that 
my primary identity at its core is spiritual. That blackness, though important to who I am, is not the primary identity. The thing that makes me one with all of my brothers and sisters on this Zoom call, the thing that makes me one with my brothers and sisters in Ukraine, the thing that makes me one with my brothers and sisters in Latin America, with my indigenous brothers and sisters across the reservations, the things that makes me one with my brothers and sisters in Africa and all over the world is that spiritual vibrational energy that comes from the living God. That's the primary identity. And all those secondary realities, be ye black, white, be ye Latino, be ye indigenous, what have you, important, yes. Because this is a faith that, that has this aspirational goal, unity through diversity, unity in diversity, not unity in, same, in sameness, right? Which is a duplicitous trick that some would like to practice. So what they'll say is that I don't wanna talk about the issue of race because we're all one. Well, yes, we are one, but we also have experiences specific to our cultural, um, to the cultural space from which we have elicited, that from which we come from. And so unity and through diversity, right? This ability to hold on the one hand, the reality of our shared humanity, and then also to respect the variations on that theme. I don't know about you, but I don't have a singular palate when I go out to eat. I mean, I grew up eating soul food, um, growing up in, uh, in New York City, uh, growing up a little bit in Miami, Florida, growing up in New Orleans, Louisiana, places like that. Ate a lot of really good soul food, collard greens, cornbread, fried catfish, love all of that stuff. But I also like Italian pasta. I also dig, uh, kebab. I also like a lot of other foods from around the world. Recognizing that sustenance comes from many different places and that those things that can sustain my body and keep me moving forward in a healthy way where the cells and all the atoms within my body are functioning cohesively, right? is not located in one part of the world, in one community, in one culture. It is expression across the breath, the warp and woof of humanity. Yes? So understanding this notion that my primary identity is spiritual in nature, but at the same time recognizing that my blackness, which is a social construct, it has real world and social implications, but also there's a cultural dimension to that as well, which is also very important, right? That I can bring that to the table within the context of Baha'u'llah's teachings. And if we're doing the work that we're supposed to be doing, if we are striving to live up to the example of Abdul Baha, you know, the, the son of Baha'u'llah, the prophet and founder of the faith, the perfect exemplar of the Baha'i teachings. And as far as I'm concerned, one of the baddest cats who has ever walked the planet. If we are really striving to implement his example, the teachings of Baha'u'llah, the encouragement, the counseling of the beloved guardian, the guidance of the universal house of justice, right? Then we will be creating spaces at the table for everybody to have a seat. And not only that, we will consciously with intentionality be looking around to see who's missing at the table. And if necessary, we will give up our own seat to accommodate that person. Family is an interesting word, right? One human family, family. I think of family, I think of cohesiveness. I think of family, I think of interdependence. I think of family, I think of a love that can usher you through your brightest moments and your darkest hours. When I think of family, I think of the willingness to enter into difficult conversations and not to give in to the impulse to turn away or run away because things are getting challenging and difficult, but to recognize that growth comes through challenge and difficulty. 
When I think of family, I, I think of the very real notion that I can see beyond the fictive borders that divide us, right? One of the most profound teachings in the Baha'i writings is that the earth is one country and mankind are its citizens. The earth is one country. So I might need to show my passport when I go to Ghana, West Africa, or when I, um, when I go to Turkey or some other part of the world. But I'm going to see my brothers and my sisters no matter where I am. That's family. A fierce love ethic. Fierce, the willingness to do the work, the daily toil, sometimes the unheralded work of consciously, intentionally reaching out beyond my circle, my community, my cultural community, right? My economic community, right? Reaching beyond those borders to build and extend the reach of our brotherhood, our sisterhood, our community. Fierce, not giving in to the fears of being one of only few or maybe the only one in unfamiliar surroundings, but choosing to go into those spaces, even if I don't understand the language, because that's my family. Not limiting my concern for those who look like me only, but also recognizing that a pebble thrown into a pond halfway around the world has ripples that can impact all across the globe. That's my family a fierce love ethic, cultivating the kind of love that can lead us to a point of restoration and redemption, a love that is strong enough to accommodate my failures and also my triumphs, a love that is patient enough to do the work required of building a community rooted in oneness, a love that is strong enough to endure the pitfalls, the challenges, the setbacks, the personal, the collective, the individual failings as we do this work. A love that can endure the toil, the strain, the sweat, the blood and the tears, a love that echoes in my being and compels me even when I take breaks to go again to the field, pick up my hoe and do the work to till the soil so that it will be fertile to take the seeds of a brighter future and a brilliant tomorrow. A fierce love ethic, friends. Constantly questioning myself, bringing myself to account each day, thinking about the part that I have played in this great march towards our collective maturity as a human family. Was I patient today? Did I reach out to someone who was different than me today? Did I exercise or did I think that I have conscious or unconscious thoughts of superiority or inferiority? Bringing myself to account, doing a deep internal critique, being patient and forgiving of others and also extending the grace of that also to myself. Recognizing that Masood is far from perfect. But amongst the multiplicity of things that I wrestle and struggle with, the ways that I succeed and I also fail, at the core of that is a fully acceptable human being that God, for whatever reason, sought to bring forth on the earth. And that's true for all of us. A fierce love ethic, warrior marks, those scars that we suffer as we build this beloved community. The misunderstandings that we work through with others who may not understand our motives, who may think that we are intending something other than what we are intending. Someone might say something that is deeply hurtful, right? Those warrior marks, the ability to take those cuts, as the Chinese say, Lin Chi, death by a thousand cuts, and not on our own strength, but through prayer, through faith, through the replenishment of the Holy Spirit to get up again 
and recommit myself to do the work. A fierce love ethic, courageous, intentional, persistent, redemptive, restorative, persevering, the power that ultimately will unite us all. So that's all that I have, friends. I'm done. <clears throat> wow, thank you so much, Masood. Um, I'm, I'm, I think we're all blown away by, by your presentation um, and by the, the thoughts um, and, and the challenge that you bring to each and every one of us through this presentation. Um, and we're reminded by this idea of a demanding love. I think so many of us um, have forgotten that, that love is not sentimental. I had certainly, that was something that really resonated with me, like not a sentimental love, but a demanding love. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's so important on so many levels, but yeah, definitely. Like you have to put your money where your mouth is. You know, if, if you're a demanding love is, is a love that, that requires commitment through action. And um, I think that, you know, it, it, it really, it, it really spelled out for us what, what we need to do. Um, and, you know, I think it's interesting for us as Canadians or for me as a Canadian, I'm not going to speak for all the Canadians, but I'm going to speak for myself. I was raised in Canada. And I think um, for me, you know, we always looked at this idea of, you know, the civil rights movement and um, Martin Luther King and slavery. That was them, right? Like we're, we're good Canadians. We didn't yeah. have a part in that. You know, that was kind of how um, we were also, I think, condition to think in a way growing up in Canadian schools and in, in university it's their problem it's not our problem we're not racist we don't have this problem mm -hmm. and I think that the last definitely three years has really um proven to to all of us and and um that that this is everybody's that this is everybody's work right and and I think that um especially for us as Canadians where it's not always something that I mean, for lack of a better term, it's it, 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 something that's not in our face per se all the time, you know, um, in the sense that I think in the States, it's much more part of the social discourse yeah, and sure. always has been historically. And I think um, as Canadians, we have to, to really sit with ourselves and as a Canadian and really try to see how we can do this work in an environment where maybe it's not as... Um, you know, as as easy to perhaps do if we're wanting to do it, yeah. um, than maybe in, in the United States. And I think that that's something that I personally um, have really struggled with. And I and I think that it's so important that you came and you gave us kind of a, a prescription for for how how to move forward. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you so much. And I I just want to say that. Um, the promise of Morehouse College mm. is that they don't just educate students, yeah, um, yeah. they produce men of distinction. Mm. And you, they've certainly delivered on their promise here. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to now look at some of the questions because we do have some questions and um, people have been very good at sending in the questions through the chat. So I'm going to, well, we have a lot of accolades, so, um, I think that you know that your your very beloved Masood and everyone um, was extremely riveted by your talk, and uh, they really thought it was brilliant and thought provoking. Um, I think there was somebody who asked about undaunted, which I believe maybe if you can talk about a little bit about what undaunted is and how um, we can all access. Yeah. access it and perhaps use it as a teaching tool. Sure. Um, yeah. Undaunted is a, um, it's a new uh, live podcast. So um, it's filmed and, you know, also audio and all that stuff um, with uh, my freaking brilliant co-host Nava Galili, who is um, just a really whip smart uh, young woman who, uh, keeps me straight on the podcast. <laughs> uh, but it, what it is, the, uh, the, the premise of the show is to really center the work of social justice change makers. 
So we interview a number of people in that space who are doing um, really a remarkable work. You know, one of the challenges we have um, quite oftentimes when we, if we give in to, or we find ourselves sliding into the space of despair is that we have a tendency to look at our young people sometimes and think that they are um, not engaged, not aware, or that they are um, dismissive of what's going on around them. And the individuals that we have the uh, really blessed opportunity to spend time with in these, these interviews prove to us that there is some profound work, brilliant work being done by uh, a number, uh, a diverse cohort of, um, of young people, um, both within and outside of the Baha'i community who are invested in, um, in, in, in lending their talents, um, their, um, their spiritual commitment, their dedication to uh, addressing some of the ills that afflict uh, the body politics. So that's what the show is. You can access it on, uh, on YouTube. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that's, that's what it is. You get to see in the middle of us interviewing people, you get to see Nav and I clowning around and having a good time. And uh, so, yeah, that's it. Thank you. I, I'm just gonna ask, I do have a request for you to say a closing prayer, Masood, but before you say a closing prayer, I'd like to go on with the question. So if you don't mind, if I can just scroll up and if you sure. can just give me a second so that I can, um, I can ask. I, I, I wanted to ask a question, Masood, mm -hmm. with respect to your, um, if you could just flesh out a little, this concept of um, a, a restorative and redemptive love, um, and and the 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 place of humility um, within that within the work that you do yeah. when you are working through that, yeah. Yeah, um, it seems to me that that um, that love has this um, profound capacity to. Um, for restoration um, and redemption. Restoration in the sense that, you know, um, in a small sense, if you're having a challenging day and you happen to come across a family member or a friend, um, or even somebody that you maybe you just met in the street and they say something that lifts your soul, lifts your spirit, I've seen the power of, there is something really profound about this, um, about this faculty of encouragement. You know, when they asked Abdu'l-Baha once, what was the essence of the Baha'i faith? He didn't go into some lengthy, um, in-depth uh, exposition on the spiritual verities of the Baha'i revelation. He said one word, he said encouragement. And I've seen encouragement as an expression of, of uh, love's dimension have a transformative effect, not only in my own life, but also in other people again and again. And I believe that restoration can come through um, the conscious intentional exercise of the faculty of encouragement, the quality of encouragement, redemptive, um, at the edge of our brokenness, um, whether that's a local bro brokenness, um, when I mean local, I mean individual, or whether that's a collective societal brokenness, redemption, how are we able to be redeemed um, from our brokenness? And I believe that a divine love, um, a love that is imbued with the substance of the transcendent, a love that acknowledges that we are all um, created in the image and likeness of God, that we are made of some profound magical dust. And we are all inherently noble. That that has the power to elicit, to motivate, to encourage actions that can be redemptive, that can redeem us from the pitfalls and the valleys that we have fallen into individually and also collectively. You know, I didn't one of the things I didn't share with you all in the story about um, the young woman who really was the, um, 
who mediated my introduction to the Baha'i faith, she was not a Baha'i, never became a Baha'i. Um, and um, she passed away um, at the age of 24. And it was uh, shortly, it was not too long after I had embraced the Baha'i faith. So in a very real sense, she was um, kind of a door to a new understanding for me, a new journey in my life, right? Um, in a way, she was that point of restoration and redemptive and redemption through her action, um, through giving me the gift of, um, of the knowledge of Baha'u'llah's teachings. So I don't know, does that answer the question? It does. Thank you, Masood. I was actually, you know, I was thinking when you were talking, mm -hmm. um, when you were talking about uh, love, I was thinking about the um, sermon that Archbishop, I think it was Bishop Curry gave at the royal wedding of, of um, yeah. Harry and, and Meghan, and he talked about this transformational love. Yeah. Um, and it was the only thing that, that could transform humanity was this, I thought it was such a poignant, poignant, um, you know, talk at such a poignant time. And um, so, yeah, it really reminded me of that. And I, mm -hmm. I um, so we have, if you can just give me a second because sure. I'm getting sure. more and more. Um, I just want to make sure I get everybody's question. Um, Ms. Shahla Stee, mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if that's a question, sexism and racism. Um, if, if did you want Masood to to address that, or is that I'm not sure if uh, if that was a question or you were just um, making a comment, Mrs. D. Okay, I guess. So she talked about the um, institute progress, uh, the institute process. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you want to. Uh, talk about how overcoming racism through the Institute process, or if that's something that you wanted to address? Well, I mean, you know, at the core of the Institute process really uh, fundamentally is building community. Um, and part of the praxis of that, or part of the practical application of that is through um, inviting people into your homes, uh, welcoming people into your, into your home. And, um, sharing the writings together, the holy writings, whether they're the Baha'i writings or the writings um, of other great faiths um, or other spiritual traditions that um, have the, um, the holy water of truth um, and, um, and having fellowship and studying spiritual teachings and um, having children's classes, which is part of the Institute process, junior youth empowerment programs, which is part of the Institute process. All of these activities at the core are fundamentally about building community, about um, um, sharing and uh, about lot, helping ourselves to grow individually, personally, and then also extending that growth to, um, to the collective, to the community at large. And that there is an interrelationship between the individual and the community. You know, Muhammad, Muhammad Ali, in 1975 um, was invited to Harvard University to speak to the student body. And in the middle of his talk, he was asked, um, somebody shouted, and he was standing on one of the quads in front of one of the buildings. He said, well, hundreds of people to see him. Of course, he was the heavyweight champion of the world at the time. And they said, give us a poem. And Muhammad Ali thought for a moment, and he said, me, we. Me, we a profoundly simple and profoundly deep two words, a couplet that reveals so much in its um, modesty and in its um, seemingly, um, in its seeming simplicity. Um, but that interrelationship between the me and the we, that for some reason I can't be all of the me unless I am invested in the we. And for some reason, the we can't be all the we unless we are also invested in the me. So there's this oscillating energy between the collective and the individual working together to make the individuals better, to make the community better. Um, so at the heart of it, that's what the Institute process does. Um, and all of it kind of rooted around spiritual teaching, spiritual teachings of the Baha'i faith specifically, 
and also the um, which of course shares a fundamental spiritual DNA with all of the great um, 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 revelations from God um, throughout human history. And then the social teachings, of course, which uh, are sent to us to address the specific needs of our community for today. So, yeah. And yes, the, so Mrs. D was, uh, she had, she'd been muted and I, I was able to unmute her after some struggle. So <laughs> go ahead, Mrs. D. I appreciate uh, your presentation. But uh, my, I believe very deeply that you cannot heal sex, racism without healing sexism. The two go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, when you have, uh, if you don't uh, deal with sexism, you cannot really fully deal with racism mm -hmm. and the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, Fifty percent of the population of world, world women do not have equal rights and opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, you are also looking at so they go. Uh, there is this thought by our cultures mm -hmm. constantly to uh, what we see in the media, what we see around us, and often by the family. So I'm wondering if uh, the institute process, which starts at the age of five or six mm -hmm. and empowers the youth to uh, service in humanity and the fact that we are one human family, if mm -hmm. that could eliminate both, and do you really uh, agree with me that the two go hand in hand? Well, I mean, um, I have a personal reflection on this. Um, I was raised um, for the better part of my life um, as an adolescent by my mother in New York City. Um, my mother was a relatively poor woman. She worked as a secretary in law offices. Um, but she always kept the small apartment that we had beautiful with um, secondhand furnishings creatively um, put together. My mother, um, um, from a material sense, a physical sense, was a very physically attractive woman. And I used to go to, um, we'd walk the streets of New York together. She would show me the city of Manhattan. And there were men that would whistle at her and cat calls. Now, I was maybe 11 or 12 years old, probably a buck five in terms of my weight, 105 pounds. I wanted to fight everybody because I thought I was so disrespectful and also demeaning. And um, well, at the, it just really pissed me off. So uh, I felt a deep sense of protection around my mother. And then observing her working uh, to try and put food on the table uh, to observe the ways that men objectified her gave me a profound sense of um, the moral injustice of the objectification and dehumanization of women. So my engagement around this issue begins there. Um, also from um, a cultural standpoint, there's a cultural dimension to that as well. Um, the violence visited upon black women's bodies through the history of uh, the transatlantic slave trade. Do you know that if you go to the slave fortress on, in, called Elmina in Ghana, West Africa, that if you go to the dungeons beneath the slave fortress, they had a dungeon, they had a cell for the women and a cell for the men. The cell for the women, there was a staircase that connected it to the governor's bedroom above the dungeon. And he would select which women he was going to violate and they would be marched up the staircase. That also would happen to be adjacent to the church that was on the property as well. So this issue of women's rights for me is not theoretical. It's something that's deeply personal for me. And, um, and I think you know, we, we, we have to look at these things holistically not as one or the other, although there are specific um, elements um, that uh, define each one of these um, social uh, and spiritual diseases. And I'm talking about the disease of sexism and disease of racism. But we have to understand that they're, that they're interrelated and that fighting for the one is not a negation of the other. Um, so I can 
get, I can march with my brothers and sisters for Black Lives Matter at the same time that I'm defending my sister's right to have opportunities to advance, to be educated, to be included in spaces where they historically have been, you know, marginalized or, um, or really um, um, locked out of. So um, I, to me, that's uh, that that's that's really um, um, there's there's a, that personal dimension is is so important. I think it's important for us to see them as interrelated. The institute process uh, for me, community building, it's exactly the spaces where we need to have these kinds of conversations, where we need to talk about the issue of race, talk about the issue of sexism, um, in relationship to the writings. What do the writings say about uh, women? What do the writings say about um, the diversity of the human family? What does it say about uh, people of African descent? What does it say about indigenous brothers and sisters, right? So, so that we don't just get off into our own kind of speculation and theorization and, and kind of reflection about it, which is important to do, but the framework of the teaching is a, is a, is a moral kind of centering force allows us to have the freedom to have those thoughts to wrestle with these ideas, but within that within that 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 framework that brings us back to the nobility of every human being, that brings us back to the power of forgiveness, that brings us back to the power of perseverance, that brings us back to the commitment, to the um, spiritual mandate to work for the oneness of mankind. Thanks, Masood. And I, I think that's that's so important because I think there are so many adults um, who didn't really pass on um, or passed on a negative uh, perspective with respect to racism yeah. and sexism. And their kids um, are, they inherently feel that that's wrong, you know, but they don't have anywhere where they can look to um, yeah. to get to get guidance mm -hmm. and to kind of grab on to that, you know, kind of a ray of hope. And yeah. I think that the the that the um the institute process process really really helps with that. And I I I think it's so important for our kids and our youth mm -hmm. to be really firmly firmly um, on the path mm -hmm. of um, this redemptive and and restorative love through the writings. Um, because they also can teach their parents, right? A lot of parents are are just they're lost, mm -hmm. and that's kind of one of the things that I, you know, I see um, in what I do. The kids, um, the kids are are lost, and so yeah, it's very important that that um, it's that's a that's a population that inherently feels wrong and right, yeah. right? They in, they're inherently some somehow guided towards justice innately. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I think um, that's important. Um, thank you so much, Masood. I think um, we're gonna have to have you come back again, if you will, um, yeah. for <laughs> us. <laughs> um, but uh, I am going to um, ask one more question of my mother, um, which is people are asking where the recording of Masood's talk will be able to be found, Farouz. So if you can address that as you close. Thank you once again so much, Masood. It's been a great privilege for us to have had Masood here. Um, we were very lucky that we were able to have him and hopefully he'll come again very soon. Thank you, Masood. Thank you. Thank you, Mariam. Well, Masood, since I waited for one year for you to say yes to me, I will take the opportunity to actually <laughs> ask if for a few favors. Sure. First of all, uh, my Cameroonian sisters are here, both Grace and Bridget. They mm -hmm. wanted to chat with you and please go ahead. Bridget, mm -hmm. are you on? Yes, <clears throat> excuse me. Yes, oh, I have this bad. I, I want to see you. You can, you can see me, you can see me, right? But you can't hear me, I have a sore throat. No, we can hear you, we can hear you. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Hi, hi, hi. Sue. <laughs> oh. I have to say, am I the only one calling from the U.S.? I'm here in Boston. Oh wow! Well, I'm I'm calling from the U.S. I'm I'm in Atlanta. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So we may be able to meet someday. That I'm so great. great. I'm so grateful and thankful that Farouz invited me 
mm. to this uh, forum tonight. Mm -hmm. Just listening to you talk, it's it's almost as if, <laughs> let me put it this way, like this was my last day on earth mm. and you were giving me a chance to make a difference before I move on. Mm. Mm. So yeah. it's very powerful, the message you have delivered to us here today. Mm. And the one thing that I, I want to, I don't know whether it's a question or a statement or just mm -hmm. an observation. Yeah. I have young boys. They were mm -hmm. born here in the U.S. I was born thousands of miles away in Cameroon, West Africa. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Cameroon has been going through a civil war for the past five, five, five years. Yeah. People have been killed by mm -hmm. the same government. Mm -hmm. The world has done nothing about it. Mm -hmm. Now we have the Ukrainian war. It's mm -hmm. on our American TV around the world every day. Yeah. I have my sons and they look at the discrimination when yeah. Nigerian students, African students who are studying in Ukraine, yeah. they've been pushed off the, the, uh, the train. Yeah. yeah. How do you try, how do you tell a kid yeah. it is such an unfair world Mm -hmm. This is not that one humanity that you want to preach to yeah. them. Now we are the same, made by the same God. Yeah. When you see this thing happening to people that look like you, but yeah. you do empathize with what is happening mm -hmm. because we are one humanity. Yeah. So how do you, how do we get this? Yeah. How do we get this to the young people? Because I'm not kidding you. I have a son, he's 30, 35 years old. Yes. He lives in the city of Boston. He just, he cannot stand the racism around him. Yeah. So yeah. please, I know we don't have too much time, but I would like to get your contact and maybe find a way to get, to become a Baha'i like you. Uh, well, you know, I, one of the things that I think is really important in doing this work with our young people um, is to not deny them the legitimacy of their anger. One of the emotions that um, is part of the plethora of emotions that we have access that are part of who we are as human beings is anger. Oftentimes when, it, when it's dealing with marginalized populations, um, there is a tendency to wanna to suppress or deny or repress that anger. Now, the Baha'i Writings tells us that Anger is a dangerous emotion that you have to be careful with it, right? That it has the yeah. potential to be destructive, self-destructive and other destructive. Um, but it also tells us that a legitimate expression of anger is against the bloodthirsty tyrant. In other words, against um, a, a kind of using the anger um, as a form of righteous indignation. Righteous in the sense that it's good to be, it's just to be angry about sexism, racism, about the other isms that afflict the body politic. It doesn't make me happy to see people oppressed or brutalized or murdered in Africa and then have the world turn a deaf ear because those are black and brown folk. But our brothers and sisters in Ukraine get center stage because those are people who quote unquote, look like the dominant population. It's a fundamental injustice. There's no way we can get around that. So the anger for me is, is, is when, when we, sometimes we, with our young people, we, we tell them that you can't be angry. And I, I don't, to me, that's not healthy. I say, it's okay to be angry. The only question now is what are you gonna do with the anger? Is it gonna be destructive or can you use it constructively? Can you, galvanizing all of that, those, those feelings of righteous indignation, justifiably so against the injustices that you see in the world. Can you use that as a kind of energy? Can you transform it? Can you perform a kind of spiritual alchemy that refuses to give up on the inherent nobility of every human being? and the ultimate destiny of the oneness of the human family, that spiritual reality. You can use that energy, that force to continue 
to work for that, saying that I don't care what is going on around me. I am not going to allow the conditions in the world to steal my place from making my contribution to this work. And so I think it's, you know, it, it's, it's helping them to understand that it's not something to be, um, it's something to be regulated and controlled. It's something to be utilized as a, for, as a source of energy um, to help make change. And, um, and so I, I think that, um, that we have to continue, you know, uh, black and black boys, um, I'm, you know, I'm working on a book about the life of my mother right now. And uh, at the heart of the book is this story of my matriculation from a boy into manhood and in my, rela my relationship to my mother and watching her try to usher me in to adulthood in safety, right? Without going crazy, without losing me to the prison system, without losing me to some other self-destructive force or other destructive force. So the, 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 the job of doing that, that Black women have been forced to do because of the very real existential threat that they are confronted with on a daily basis is heroic work. Society may not acknowledge it. They may overlook it. But you're heroes for doing the everyday hard work of trying to bring these young brothers into their adulthood safely and with a sense of self intact. And so I wanna, as you wrestle with this with your boys and trying to keep them from the pitfalls of despair, right? To help them to, um, to maintain, to, to aggressively cling to their hope in spite of the challenges and the difficulties. I also want to acknowledge the work that you are doing. And I see in hearing your story, I hear my mother's story, you know? And I know that story very well after having watched my mother for so many years do the same thing with me. So um, I just want to uh, say how much I respect the work that you're, that you're doing and, um, and don't give up and, um, and let them know that, they're, that they are not the first ones to walk this journey, that there have been millions of us who have walked it before and that they have community that they can go to, people that they can call on when things get difficult to offer that precious word of encouragement, which is so vitally needed um, throughout the human family, so. Bridget, I'm wondering if Grace is available to talk. Grace, do you want to talk? Do you want to show us your face or not? Grace is Bridget's sister and yeah. so my sister. Okay, probably Bridget, maybe Grace is gone. Uh, I want I'm to... sorry, Kafuros, I can't speak because I'm with my granddaughter and she's making so much noise. <laughs> we love you. We love you. <laughs> we love you too. Thank what you. do you have what do you have to tell Masood? I think she's busy with her, I think she said her niece or her her granddaughter. Her granddaughter, yeah. She's she's kind of got her tied up, I think. <laughs> Thank you very much. Masood, there are so many things on chat, it, it drives me crazy, but I wanted to acknowledge the presence of uh, some of our friends from Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And I would like to uh, honor uh, Mr. Sri Prubo, who, who has been here for the first time from Indonesia. Mm -hmm. I'm very grateful for them uh, to participate on a weekly basis. Uh, if, if and from Norway and from Norway Alex thank you so much Alex do you have anything to say to Masood 
Alex is a personal friend, so probably a little bit of, yeah. Mm. Alex? Oh, I wouldn't deserve it. Thank you. This is just amazing. <clears throat> uh, Masood, it's, uh, it's a really blessing that you can have, have these forums where you can use your speech. Mm. Speech will change the world. Mm. No doubt. Um, uh, of course, this story resonates perfectly with with um, with uh, the the story of the the Old Testament, the mm -hmm. story of Joseph. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're aware. <laughs> I'm sure you, you agree. Yeah. I mean, and it, and it's it's uh, uh, retold in the in the Quran mm -hmm. so eloquently, so beautifully. Yeah. This is <laughs> you're in in the jail in the in the mm. in the in the <laughs> And um, yeah, you have no no way out, you might say. And uh, uh, but to use your spiritual faculties, and of course, you, we see what that story. So, uh, Joseph was was promoted to the highest uh, governing position in the con in, in the realm of the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very promising. Mm -hmm. Lovely to hear you. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Also, uh, I think. Um, I think Mr. Uh, Mr. Siri Promo from Indonesia would like to address you, Masood. Sure, Mr. Sure. Siri Promo, uh, are you able to unmute yourself? Lorley. Okay, I try to unmute. Thank you. Did I succeed? Yes, yes, you did. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, but I'm very sorry, I came too late actually to this meeting. Mm -hmm. I thought it was eight o'clock Indonesia time. <laughs> so <laughs> I just, uh, but I enjoyed the discussion after your last sentence mm -hmm. and your uh, mention on encouragement and how to cope with the youth, especially when they are being, uh, 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 not ostracized. I don't know the correct word for that. So I don't have any questions actually, but I was looking at your artwork and one, one was very intriguing for me, which is uh, handcuffed mm -hmm. hands above a Bible. Mm -hmm. I felt uh, somewhat related to that. Mm -hmm. Is there a story behind that? Thank you. Um, I think the piece you're talking about is called uh, Pipeline. So it's about the um, school to prison pipeline. So actually the, the hands are cuffed over a dictionary with the word pipeline circled. Um, the school to prison pipeline is um, an American phenomenon um, in the educational system where um, students of color, particularly black and brown kids are disproportionately suspended and expelled from school which in turn um, leads them, um, as most kids, when they have unstructured free time, um, to getting into trouble and possibly um, ending up in the prison system. So it's a way that the education system in America has um, this perverse iteration of the um, educational system. How has it become a feeder, a feeder system, in some cases, into the prison system? Does that make sense? <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Spear Pronov. We'll see you next week. Thank you for coming. Lorlaine, do you have anything to share with us? We just see you smile. Can you unmute yourself? No? How about now? Thank you. Am I am I unmuted? Absolutely. Well, I don't really have any questions. I just thought it was a very, very interesting talk. And you remind me so much of my son. I have to tell him all about you. <laughs> <laughs> He'll Thank be you. most impressed. Thank you. Thank you. My, my pleasure.
next time Masood is going to be back, it's going to be sooner than one year. And please bring your sons with you. Mr. Perimal, how are you? Would you like to say anything? From Australia. Yeah, I'm good. Uh, very nice name, Masood, my favorite name. Thank you for your talk. I just want to know why is that indigenous people and the black people are the most incarcerated people in the world? Mm -hmm. In Australia, that also happens. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a, that's a, it's a difficult question. I, I mean, it's, um, if we look at the origins of, uh, of racism in America and in the West, um, it's tied to the economic system. So um, racism was a way to justify the enslavement of African peoples. It was an invention, a construct, um, an innovation in order to keep the coffers full um, for Europeans who were um, making the quote unquote new world. And then of course, there's the arrogance that goes along with imperialism and um, the expansion of one's uh, footprint on spaces that uh, one believes one has rights to without considering the people who have existed on those spaces for generations. So um, the indigenous community, they were enslaved first. I mean, they, they tried to enslave indigenous um, American um, indigenous peoples first, um, indigenous peoples to this to, to, to this country, but um, there was the outbreak of, of disease, which um, decimated the indigenous population. Um, and, um, and so they turned their attention to, um, to, to West Africans, in particular because of the crops they were cultivating, rice, sugar, indigo, um, cotton, there were West Africans who had skill sets that um, would aid them in um, building empire here uh, in the New World. So that's my that's my historical <laughs> my, my quick historical analysis. Uh, but uh, yeah, it it, um, it has a lot to do with economics and the and the desire to want to um, to maintain power at any cost. So. Thank you very much, Masood. Mm -hmm. So we will uh, start our devotions uh, for at least 10, 20 minutes. And could you start us off, Masood, please, with a prayer? Sure, I have to, uh, yeah. I'll say one for um, our brothers and sisters in Ukraine, um, all of those who are struggling around the world, be they whatever part of the world they're in, Test and difficulties, um, social unrest in Africa, in Ukraine, other parts of the world, in America. Oh, my Lord, my defender, my help in peril, lowly do I entreat thee, ailing do I come unto thee to be healed, humbly do I cry out to thee with my tongue my soul, my spirit. O oh God, my God, the gloom of night hath shrouded every region and all the earth is shut away behind thick clouds. The peoples of the world are sunk in the black depths of vain illusions while their tyrants wallow in cruelty and hate. I see nothing but the glare of searing fires that blaze upward from the nethermost abyss. I hear nothing save the thunderous roar that belloweth out from thousands upon thousands of fiery weapons of assault, while every land is crying aloud in its secret tongue, my riches avail me nothing and my sovereignty hath perished. O oh, my Lord, the lamps of guidance have gone out. The flames of passion are mounting high and malevolence is ever gaining on the world. Malice and hate have overspread the face of the whole earth. And I find no souls except thine own oppressed small band 
who are raising up this cry. Make haste to love, make haste to trust, make haste to give, to guidance come. Come ye for harmony, to behold the star of day. Come here for kindliness, for ease. Come here for enmity and peace. Come and cast down your weapons of wrath till unity is one. Come and in the Lord's true path, each one help each one. Verily with exceeding joy, with heart and soul do these oppressed divine offer themselves up for all mankind in every land. Thou seest them, O my Lord, weeping over the tears thy people shed, mourning the grief of thy children, condoling with humankind, suffering because of the calamities that beset all the Denzians of the earth. O my Lord, wing them with victory, that they may soar upward to salvation. Strengthen their loins in service to thy people and their backs in servitude to thy threshold of holiness. Verily thou art the generous, verily thou art the merciful. There is none other God save thee, the clement, the pitiful, the ancient of days, Abdul Baha. Miss Merdity, would you read from Quran, please? Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Salam for everybody. Mm -hmm. I am very happy to join the meeting. <laughs> Thank you very much for the much. <laughs> we'll pray to Katia, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Masro. I share fight here. Yeah? Yes. When we act to the Quran, we have to read like that. I will pray in Arabic mm. and Indonesian. I am very sorry. I I will not uh, uh, apa, to English. I can I can pray in in English, but I will pray in Arabic yes. and Indonesian. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Malik Yawm Al-Din Iyaka Na'budu Wa Iyaka Nasta'in Ghairi al-maghdubi alayhim waladdu'ali amin. In Indonesia, dengan nama Allah yang maha pengasih dan penyayang, segala puji bagi Allah. Allah yang maha pengasih dan penyayang. 
Allah penguasa alam semesta. Allah pemilik hari pembalasan. Hanya kepada engkau kami menyembah dan meminta pertolongan. Tunjukkanlah kami jalan lurus seperti jalan orang-orang yang kau beri nikmat. Bukan jalan orang-orang yang sesat. Sadakallahul aziz. Maha suci Allah dengan segala firman. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. So beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Tara? Hovala. <laughs> <laughs> Rabbana wa malazana azal kurubana be buzur shams va'dakal karim وخفف همومنا به نزول ملائکت نصر کل مبین افسارنا بمشاهدت آیات امریکا ربنا افرغ علينا صبرا من لدن ربنا افتح على وجوهنا ابواب السعاده ورخاء مزغنا حلاوة الحناء وارفعنا مغاما أنت وتنا بهين في صحفك وكتب إلى متى يا إلهنا هذا الظلم وطغيان Alamatan 
It's already 10 o'clock. I was hoping that Alex would say a prayer in Norwegian, but I have, we, we have kept Alex. I'm sorry, Masood, that you had to stay here till so late. Usually, <laughs> usually our speakers would leave. That was so nice and kind of you to stay with us the whole night. We appreciate it. Oh, I was happy to do it, and the prayers were such a beautiful way to to, uh, to, to complete everything. So I feel like the circle is complete. So thank you, thank you so much. Alex, would you like to say a prayer in Norwegian or are you just clapping your hand? I was just clapping. But would you like to say a prayer? Gladly. <clears throat> this is a prayer for healing. Yeah, ilahi. Ismu kashifai wa dhikruka dawai wa qurbuka rajai wa Hamukamuni 
في الدنيا والاخيرة وانك انت المعتل عليم الحكيم Thank you very much for your Arabic prayer, Alex. Thank you. Next time you'll say it in Norwegian. <laughs> Masood, it was wonderful to be at your presence. It was just for me, it was like being back home. Uh -huh. I was just home. Thank you very much. Friends, thank you for coming and sharing this beautiful evening with us, particularly my uh, Cameroonian sisters who are sending us love. Thank you very much. See you next week. And we will ask Masood to come back. Masood, I only wish you could go through all the messages in chat. And I also wanted to add to thank Mr. Jabiri uh, as well as Irash Khan for uh, giving us this particular Zoom link. Thank you very much for everything. Good evening, everyone.